So I'm I'm really I'm thrilled to have this meeting. We actually haven't had a community meeting since the spring because we had our June meeting, um, annual meeting, and then we skipped um, July and August. So great to great to be back. Um, very excited. Um, so let me explain a little bit about the agenda today. And I'm I'm only going to uh, talk for a couple minutes and then turn it over to other folks. Um, so I want to give an update on our board of directors. We actually have an open seat and we would love to receive nominations from the community. You can nominate yourself or, or somebody else who you would think would wanna be part of this. I'll explain a little bit more about the board. Um, we remind people that we did have a release that went out in June, the 1.8.1. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about that release, but I do wanna have a, a slide to just remind people. Um, and after every release, what do we do? We start working on the next release. And so that's what the majority of this um, meeting will be around, about is talking about some of the enhancements around our data extract aggregate table um, you know, development that, that we're um, beginning to work on. And we definitely want to hear from the community and you know, let us know if we're going down the right direction or if you have any um, suggestions. Um, and then certainly open discussion. So first on the board of directors, um, here is the list of our uh, current board. Um, we've got a number of uh, founding uh, uh, folks that have been around working on ITB2 from the beginning, um, and also others that are part of academic medical centers, industry, we've got uh, representatives from um, Europe. So it's a really, really great, very diverse group of, of people. Um, and we meet on a quarterly basis. And let me jump to the next slide. Welcome back. <laughs> somebody's, somebody's not muted. OK, so we they meet on a quarterly basis. And here's some of the roles and responsibilities. So regular attendance. So um, the, re the requirements are the, the board member ha has to um, attend at least 50% of our board meetings um, and also participate in our sponsorship program. And there's a wide variation of how that works across the different board members. Some are contributing sponsors, like small companies and AMCs are $5,000 a, a year. Corporate sponsors are 20. Um, but we also have a, in a, uh, a sustain, sustaining um, sponsor, which is uh, somebody that really wants to provide in-kind support. Um, to help us with, you know, our setting up our environments or or that type of thing, helping out with with our meetings, um, and we also have uh, folks that, that contribute development. So there's a, a wide range of of ways you can contribute as a board member. Uh, the nomination process. I think you probably have received an email. Um, it went out, um, I think, Monday morning, yesterday morning. That has a link to a form where you can um, nominate yourself or somebody, someone else. So I encourage you to, to certainly um, uh, send us some nominations. Just a reminder, as I said, 1.8.1 has been released. Um, we have had a number of hospitals that have uh, picked up the release and are working through it now. Um, it will be rolled out to the, I think, 52 hospitals within the INACT network um, within the coming months. So there'll be um, a, a large group of, uh, of organizations that will be using this um, over the next you know, number of months. So that's, that's exciting. Um, just a, a note, um, I stole Jeff Clan's slide here saying that we these are all of the releases that we've um, put out over the past four years. So we continue to um, to enhance the software. We continue to um, to move releases out. So that's pretty exciting. And now we're working on 1.8.2. Um, here's just a list of the high level list of the things that were in 1.8.1. I I don't need to go through this. We've we've had a lot of meetings around this, but. Um, certainly, if you're rolling it out, if you run up, uh, up against any issues, let us know. We're, we're, um, we're here to help you. So any, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Mitch and Anna Pama, but any questions about what I've um, presented before I hand this over? Let's see. Okay. 
Okay. No? All right. Then I'm going to stop sharing. And I don't know, Anna Palma, um, Nitch, who's first? I'll, I'll go first and I'll, I'll share my screen. Okay. Can you see can you see my slides or great? All right. Um, so I'm just gonna be going over uh, exporting data in I2B2. Um, and then uh Anupama's gonna give the entire workflow process um right after this. So really quick agenda. I'll talk about uh data exports, what's currently available in I2B2, as Diane mentioned, um in 1.8.1. Uh, what we're working towards in 1.8.2, um, go over the aggregate table tool um, that is being developed right now. And then later on, Anupam is going to talk about the entire data request and management workflow um, process. And as Diane mentioned, soliciting any, any feedback um, that the community has. Uh... So... Um... For any site who has already tried 1.8.1 or wants to try, um, so there is a new uh, kind of first class um, in I2B2, a data export feature that allows investigators to make data requests and then admins to process those requests. So um, I2B2 1.8.1 out of the box comes with these kind of predefined uh, types of, of data exports. So for example, demographics data, medications, uh, procedures, and, and so forth. And what you get here is row level data um, directly from the fact table um, joined with the content dimension table, depending on the, the, on, on the export type. Um, and so you get kind of slices of uh, the fact table um, based off of the query that, that that you ran. And of course, there's actually several types of, of data exports um, that kind of third-party plugins that have been shipping with I2B2 um, for several years. Um, but this is kind of the first time that it is actually built into the, to the server side of, of I2B2. Um, so all of these uh, types of, of data exports you see here, medications, procedures, and so forth, are uh, customizable and, and can be uh, defined by the admin at, at your site. And so these really translates to, uh, you know, kind of a little bit complicated SQL queries with, with variables and so forth that capture um, uh, references to the query that, that's being run. Uh, but uh, essentially these are customizable at, at, at your site. So you don't actually have to offer some of these data exports or you can offer um, additional ones. So that's that's out now. You can actually download uh, 1.8.1. But in the next version of I2B2, as, as, as Diane mentioned, um, we're working towards a different type of data export, um, what we're calling an aggregate table. And so this is a a wide file. You you you've worked with you know anyone who's familiar with R or SAS. You worked with these wide files before, um, and essentially these this is like a one row uh, per patient file, and it can have uh, many columns with with various aggregation options. And so, um, at 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 the bottom of this uh, slide here, it's just an example. Uh, table um, of kind of what the output would look like. So um, for example, from patient num all the way, you know, gender, age, race, and so forth. So this is the, the, the simple type of um, demographics type of values that would come out of your patient dimension table in I2B2. But what I've highlighted in, in pink here on the right-hand side, these are customizable um, columns in this table in which an investigator can actually just drag uh, as many terms from the navigate terms panel from the ontology uh, into in, in, into this user interface and then start to define their own columns. And so for example, in, in this uh, 
in this mock-up, uh, I've dragged over uh, type two diabetes, um, and and with the um, aggregation option of yes or no. So I want to see it, does this exist, and then hemoglobin A one C, um, and here you can even see. Uh, I I just want to see the maximum value. So what you can see here for for seven uh you know patients you would get their demographic information but then you would also see you know yes yes no no and so forth for for a you know uh for this diagnosis and for this kind of numeric lab value um because i've asked for maximum value you would get the numeric value directly in in the um column and i'll go into more a little bit more detail in, this, in a few minutes I wanted to kind of just talk about uh, the the originations of this of this work. Um, so we have a biobank portal um, running at Mass General Brigham um, that has consented uh, biobank patients, and we have actually implemented this type of aggregate data exporter uh, at MGB that allows investigators to do, you know, to export exactly these types of tables. So you can see that this is a plugin in the old version in, in 1.7. I believe 13 of I2B2. Um, and we, um, because the patients here are consented and there's, and they've accepted a data use agreement, we allow these limited data sets to be created directly in the biobank portal. But as you can see in, in, in the screenshot, uh, in the dropdown, uh, these are the same type of aggregation options uh, you, um, that 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 I'll go through. Um, it's worth mentioning we've learned a lot about this over several years. So this um, plugin has been available to investigators at MGB for um, almost ten years, uh, with thousands and thousands of data um, exports, and so uh, we've we've even seen some um, investigators. Uh, define their tables um, over 100 columns wide. So they've dragged over, um, you know, 100 different types of terms and with different types of aggregation options um, because they want to further analyze that file in, in R, for example. So in I2B2 1.8.2, which is coming soon, uh, this, uh, basically the aggregate table uh, plugin was ported. I guess the best parts were ported to, um, you know, the new web client plugin architecture. And so this is just a screenshot of, of um, how it currently looks. It's been simplified um, a lot just to make it easier to use. And I'll just go over what the aggregation options look like um, in a second. But this basically allows you to. Uh, define the table structure just just as a, as I've mentioned, um, and also save and load. So this is kind of important. So if I if if an investigator basically defines a table that's like you know fifty columns wide or hundred columns wide as a, as I've mentioned, um, you can actually save that table definition and then apply it to other queries, you know, in the future. So this is kind of important. You don't actually have to redo any of this creating the table um, specification. It also allows you to preview the table um, just to see what kind of in that mock-up way that that I've showed, um, just to see kind of like the first five patients, does this kind of look like the output that you want to um, export? Um, to look at some of the aggregation options, uh, going back to that example that I showed um, earlier, you can see on the left-hand side, if you basically drag in a term that is your typical uh, uh, kind of observation fat constant dimension term with no values attached to it. Uh, for example, here, type 2 diabetes. Um, you would see a list of aggregation options that you could select from. So um, I've already showed, you know, existence, yes or no. But the output can also um, uh, show, you know, the counts, for the number of concepts, the number of dates, encounters, facts, uh, providers, or even you want to see, you know, in that column, you want to see, you know, when when was the first or last occurrence um, for that patient, right? 
But if you drag over a lab value, and so for example here, hemoglobin A1C, um, which is a numeric value, um, and 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 in you know in your typical I2B2 query, if you drag this over, you would get kind of that pop up that allows you to define, um, you know, a specific uh, value range. You would see um, in addition to all of the options on the left hand side, there's also a number of calculated options that pertain to this specific numeric value. So um, it, for instance, you could see the minimum value, the maximum value, you know, the average, median, the first value, what was the last value that was that, you know, that 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 the person had, um, or or counting the number of values that that exist. So um, you know, just to kind of look at this mock-up again, on the left hand on the right hand side, so this is existence, right? So you would see yes, a bunch of yeses or nos. But for maximum value, uh, you would see, you know, what is the maximum H one A one C um, uh, of, for for that patient? And again, this is one patient per row, and I could have several several other columns that that um, have you know either either the same or different concepts with different aggregation options. I think that was my last slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Anupama, who's going to show you exactly kind of how you initiate this type of request and how the admin in ITB2, you know, would potentially service that request. Thanks, Mitch. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, so, um, so I would think of sort of the, the trying to get data out of the system in terms of like three big steps. So the first step, Nitch just walked through. So that's for the researcher to define their aggregate table. Um, so we did that through the plugin architecture. So they would um, load the, uh, the plugin and they would just pull over concepts from the ontology to build out that table that they wanted to create. And once they're done uh, creating that table, they can also, as Nitch showed, preview the data um, which will load some um, synthetic or mock data so they can sort of see what the layout will be. So that's really the first step is, is creating those table um, schema, that table definition, um, so that they can reference it um, in the future. The next step is actually how do we make that data request? And as Niche showed, we're trying to incorporate this into how we had built it out for 1.8.1. Um, so I don't have it annotated here, but what you're seeing here is those original requests that Niche pointed out. So the demographic, medications, um, and then I'll point out that the last three, so the last three are actually templates that the user created. So they would define these uh, table schemas in step one. Um, and once they were done defining them, they would appear here when the user is ready to run the query. So it's trying to have this seamless sort of um, workflow where the all the requests are done in one place right when you're about to run your query. Um, so especially for these data requests, we know that there's often IRBs um, that are associated with it. And we wanted to make sure that they would um, capture that information when they're running the query. So this is just a mock-up of how that would look like. So if you can imagine um, that this would be its own section. So kind of up here, query results is collapsed. Um, then you have data request, and then you would have a third section for the, the information for the custom data request. And here the user can enter a single IRB number and they can enter an email that um, would be notified or they can be contacted with um, down the road. And then they would just run the request. So that's really how we wanted to integrate the process of actually requesting the data into the existing run query workflow. Uh, so then after that, the third step is how do I manage or keep track of all of my existing requests? So. This is a uh, very conceptual. So these are wireframes that I have put together. Um, but what we're proposing is actually a um, another plugin to help manage all of the requests that the researcher makes. 
So they would log into the analysis tool. So you'll see that the data export plugin is here, but um, they'll log into the request management console. Um, now this plugin would be available to both the researcher who would view all the requests that they made. Um, and it would also be available to the admin so that the admin can look through all of the requests across um, the instance of I2B2. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out is that um, for these requests, um, a researcher would have to have um, a permission associated to it. So I believe right, it's set to, I think, de-identified user or higher. So they would have to have that specific um, permission setting in order for this plugin to even appear um, from this dropdown list. So they would click on the Request Management Console plugin. And then this is just an example of what it might look like. So that's why it's still a mock-up version. So again, this is from a researcher's point of view. So this particular researcher had created about three requests. Um, so at a minimum, we'll try to display the name of the request, the query ID that was associated with that request when they ran the query back in step two, um, the date that it was run, um, and this is where we would also capture that IRB number that they had um, um, specified in step two, and then the status of the request. And I'll, um, in a few slides, I'll walk through a workflow for, for how that status might look like. And then here on the action columns, the user, you know, at this step, if it's showing up in this list, the idea is that they've already made the request. So they can go and be able to view details of that request. And then another important function is in case they might want to cancel um, that request. So this is, again, the point of view from a researcher. Um, and on the next mock-up, this is how it might look if an admin logged in. So you'll see from... Um, there's a bunch of different users here. So again, the, the role of the admin is to view and manage all the requests that are coming in through that instance. Um, another thing that we are trying to do here is put together um, a estimated set size so they can try to figure out how big or small the, the actual output file is. Um, and then again, the status of um, what of each state of a particular request. Um, and then again, they would also have a view detail page um, and I'll show that next. So here on the view details page on the left-hand side, we just have a, a read only, the intent is that it's supposed to be a read only view of the request details. This is like metadata about that particular request. So the name, the query ID is associated with, the date that it was requested, the user, email ID, IRB number, patient set size, and the data request type. And on the right-hand side is really where all the actions are. So from here, um, the use, uh, research or the admin would um, change the status. They can actually go ahead and try to trigger um, the actual creation of that data file. Um, and then um, once it's available, they can go ahead and um, upload it to an enclave or um, in a secure manner, pass it back to the researcher, and then they would be able to enter comments here. So this is where um, most of the um, actions for the admin would occur. Okay. And then finally, this is just a proposed workflow for um, how information is sort of shared between a, or how the, the information, the uh, communication of where that request is between a researcher and an admin. Um, so I'll start here first. The researcher, which is in blue, uh, would log into I2B2 with LDS or higher credentials. Um, they would access that plugin that Niche showed. Um, they would create that table definition. Um, and then when they actually go ahead and are back in the main find patients tab and they create their query definition, they would actually um, select uh, the patient set and then run that query. Um, so that's here. And at that point, the status is submitted. Um, and the, the handoff from, from this state to the admin is that a email gets, an email notification gets triggered. And that will sort of be a clue for the admin to 
log into the request management plugin. So they would log into the tool. Um, they would see the details of the request. Um, and at that point, we're suggesting that the status would be under review so that the researcher, and then this would then also be um, uh, displayed in the researcher's view. Um, so they would see that their current request is under review. And this could be process that's, um, of course, it's unique to each site. So it'd be an offline process that the sites would do to verify that this is an actual eligible request. Um, if it's not an eligible request, they can mark the status as declined so that the researcher knows that there's something that they might need to um, do in order to get that data. Um, if it's yes, then we're suggesting that the status would be changed to approved. Um, and then there is sort of a, a probably some type of time gap between when the status gets approved to when that data file is actually ready to be shared. And if that's the case, if there is like some type of time lap lapse, um, then we can change the stat um the status to file available so that when it's there's actual no, actions for the researchers to do, then they can go and actually go and get access to their file once it's actually um, been physically created. So this is sort of these three steps. So like creating the aggregate table, um, actually making the request in the run query console window and then managing the request. So these three steps are actually the, the workflows that we want to incorporate for like an end-to-end -end, um, feature. So that was all I had. So if there's any questions, happy to answer them. Okay, Mark, you've got your hand raised. Can you unmute yourself? <clears throat> Hi, <clears throat> hope you can hear me. Hello, thank yep. you very much for that great presentation. I, I, uh, I have a question about making up the um, uh, making up the the table of uh, of concepts that you want to have downloaded. So um, let's say I drag a concept over, and I say, I, okay, for this concept. I want the count of you know something. And then that same concept, I want to drag it over again and say, not only do I want the count, I want also the maximum value for that lab result or something. Mm -hmm. So can you drag over the same concept multiple times and make multiple columns for the same concept? Yep. Uh, Nitch, do you want to take this or? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly, Mark. You can you can do that. And and what we found in the Biobank portal is people do exactly that. Um, they actually drag over the um the concept. I think sometimes we've seen like 10, 10 different columns, so 10 different times, and then they have a different aggregation option. Um the, some of the most common is like you know, the first value, the last value, or or even the um the the first and last dates and the number of you know fact counts and so forth. So Yep, absolutely. We can do that. Great. Thank you very much, Nitch. Any other questions about this? Actually, the, the, the floor is open. So questions, comments, other topics that, that folks want to bring up? Has anybody tried to install 1.8.1? to get feedback on how that's going. Mark, your hand is raised again. Yeah, this is Mark again. So I just wanted to kind of get some um, some clarification on the different ways that people can, can get information or export from I2B2. And so uh, back in the olden days, a few years ago, um, I think that we had this, this way of the, the plugin was called Export XLS, I think was the, one of the great plugins that we were using, and that's useful. And then another thing we had was something that was called a project request to actually generate like a new project in I2B2. And so those were like things that researchers could use to get information 
um, specifically that they wanted from, from the I2B2. And so um, uh, I like the, the new export um, things that are coming up. And it looks like in 181, I wasn't aware of this, that you have these requests that you can build that are built in already. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on how that works and um, the, the, the new thing that's coming up in 182 that's gonna replace or it's going to augment the things that are built into 181 already and uh, what becomes of the um, export, S export XLS plugin? Is that really not necessary anymore? How do, so what's happening? If someone could summarize all that, please. I, I, I unfortunately missed the very beginning of the question, but uh, what what uh, we're doing is uh, 1.8.2 is building on the work in 1.8.1. So the data export from 1.8.1 made some changes to I2B2 that the 1.8.2 work will leverage in, in order to offer this different type of table export. We do anticipate continuing to offer the fact table, table export also. Um, export XLS was always a uh, kind of a demo project that uses the PDO to generate XLS files. And it still will exist as a demo thing that looks kind of cool, but uh, I'm not aware of anyone actually using that in production, um, but we'll continue to put it in the web client. Uh, do you want me to comment on the uh, project request? Sure. Uh, okay, so the project request, um, it wasn't like it's not a production ready uh, plugin. Uh, the idea of it was that you could use it to create a project uh, and that eventually would connect up to some stored procedures and it would create uh, it would create that project based on what you criteria you set. So like let's say you uh, dragged over like you want everyone who's uh, between the ages of 30 to 50 and you'd run that query, it comes back with a million patients. Uh, there then the idea of the project request was you can say, okay, I want to take that patient cohort of a million patients and create a new project from that. And then it would create a whole new project. And when you log into I2B2, you could then see, oh, there's this project with uh, people between 30 to 50. I think that's what I said. Uh, and have, and then you could then do queries on it. I want to see how many people have asthma and stuff like that. And it would kind of be a project that's kind of uh, saved in time. That that was the important part is because you'd be updating your uh, EHR. The EHR would be updating your I2B2 all the time. And so instead of it being a million, it's now a million and 10 patients. Uh, but then like this would be like a set in time. It would always be a million. It would never change. Um, it could be used for like research papers or whatever, because then um, you could do peer review or whatever you wanted to do. Uh, so that was kind of the idea of it. Uh, so, like, I think there was still a demand. <laughs> Somebody asked me for it maybe two weeks ago, actually. Oh. And we didn't know if it was still available. I want to say somebody from the UC system. Yeah, it, it's in. The, it's there. It's just uh, it's. So it actually creates a new I two B two project with a it the whole cohort of data. data. No, it doesn't do the whole cohort thing. I think what it does is, uh, once you submit it, it saves that project request stuff into a table. I think it's a PM project request, and I think that was kind of as far as we kind of got with it. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. And I, and I just wanted to add, going back to Mark's question about the different export types. Um, so as, as Jeff mentioned, export XLS was, um, you know, if, if you look at the code is developed as a kind of like a front end uh, type of kind of client side using, you know, directly to the uh, I2B2, getting the patient data object, the PDO, and then processing it from there. So where kind of these data export types are moving to are kind of this high throughput um, with emphasis on performance. So the big difference of of the in you know what's available in 1.8.1, getting that row level data, uh, you, you know, as as Mike has um, I think Mike's presented kind of the that 1.8.1 data export tool um earlier on, but uh it it maybe correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but it, it, it uh, exports like, I think 
tens of millions of 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 observation facts out of the observation table um in just kind of several minutes so within you know as the admin uh processes that request you can actually you know get um large amounts of data and a large file created um um for that type of export and then of course there's further use cases you could um it, that that file could be saved securely in an enclave and and so forth um and and kind of the same thing applies to this aggregate table for for 1.8.2 uh the performance is 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 very good and so we've seen in the biobank portal that people would want to create you know a very wide file so sometimes the, the files as i mentioned before is like 50 columns uh wide um but the number of patients could be like 75,000 or 100,000 patients. So you would have 100,000 rows, you know, times 75 columns. And then uh, the store procedure, because that's happening in the back end, uh, the creation of that file is is is, is very um, quick. So that's the kind of the big difference. So the um, this is Mark again. So the um, the requests uh, export requests that you can make uh, in one eight one, those are going to be augmented by the requests that are coming out in one eight two. It's not going to replace them, and these altogether are really like an advanced version of the export XLS, which was really more like a, a demo project or a demo plugin. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so the features coming out in one day, eight dot two, uh, not eight dot two, is uh, is augmenting. It's a different type of data export, but um, as as uh, Anupama kind of demonstrated, we want to use the same type of work workflow framework where you have the request being made, you know, an admin being able to service that request, um, and, and various you know variables, IRB numbers and stuff captured throughout that workflow. Um, but in 1.8.1, if you try it out right now, you can actually get uh, right like slices of the Austrian fact table, uh, very long uh, data files, and then coming soon in 1.8.2, you'll get you'll be able to create these uh, you know wide kind of summary uh, analysis files. Thank you very much for uh, for clarifying all that. Thank you. Right, thanks, Mark. Any other questions about this? If not, any other topics that you'd like to either bring up or topics you'd like to see us talk about at the next community meeting? Um, don't forget, we also have working groups. So we've got a UI working group that talks a lot about in depth about you know this and other UI changes. Um, Mich Michelle runs the ontology working group, which is um, I think it's this Thursday. Um, so de definitely join the working groups or ping us. Anything else from the group? Um, I, I do have a question that you're probably not going to answer, but we're, I, I know it's only September, but we need to start thinking about the, the date for the next um, annual symposium in uh, 2025. And we did it in, in June this year, um, and we had we switched to September for you know for a number of years, and we did it in June. And I'm just wondering, does anybody have any comments or preferences or thoughts about the right time? No matter what time we pick, it's not going to be right for for everybody. But is June better better than September? Any preferences? I'm not seeing any. It's hard to think a year ahead. <laughs> All right, well, we'll ask the question. Um, are folks going to AMIA in November, the San Francisco AMIA? All right, well, if you are, a number of us will be there. Hopefully we can catch up. 
Mark, get your hand up again. Hi, um, I hate to try and make this into a one on one between Mark Abajian and the, and the I2B2 team, but I had a, a number of other questions I was hoping you could, I could ask. So, um, number one, uh, regarding the, the I, I mentioned the export XLS plugin, which is still around. And I'm wondering, is this something that is that is working in version 181 with the new user interface, or is this something that um, uh, because uh, we've tried that and we've had some some difficulty with uh, with that in 181, and I don't know if it can if it only works, for example, in the in the old web client or if it should be working in the new web client as well. And likewise, I think there was a uh, the project request plugin did not work for us in the um, in the new uh, web client. So I don't know if those are things that need to be adjusted somehow. Maybe we're using the wrong version of some some library or something, or um, we tried it in Firefox, we tried it in in um, Edge, and just didn't seem to work. So, can anyone comment on that? Uh, so I'm guessing. Uh, so within the web client uh directory there should be uh one called like legacy plugin and then in that folder there's like i think it's a, a index .h, uh, index .php file and that needs to be edited did you edit that file oh i don't know if we did so inside of legacy plugin there's a there's a php file that needs to be edited okay. yeah let me do a quick to see if, uh, if it, it should be it's an I think it's all definitely in our documentation. Let me find it. Uh, and then I can post okay. it in the chat. Thank you. Unless, Jeff, you can find it quicker. Well, I'm looking to, but we'll see who wins. <laughs> uh, and then, um, just a moment. The... Um, If if some okay in the um, in the web the new web client for one eight one there's a new admin interface and it's a little bit different from the old admin interface as far as we can tell from um, from one dot seven and, and that era so this new user interface the web the admin in the web client uh, we didn't see any way in there to manage the approvals and projects that are associated with the project request plugin. So there's these approvals and, and projects, project requests tables in the PM database, but we couldn't find any way to, to access those from the admin interface in the new web client. Are we missing something? We need to set a flag somewhere or something so we can get access to that? Or is that just not in the new admin, uh, admin interface in the web client? Um, let me take a look at the roles again. Uh, Anna Palmer, you know, the top of your head. Um, I'm pretty sure that we were able to deal with the uh, uh, roles. Yeah. Um, so I think the for a, a um, for a user, you can associate a user to a project, and then in the in the project page, be able to define that role for that user. Um, I just want to make sure if that's your question or if it's a my, my question. Together. My question was about the project request plugin. The project request plugin requires the tables in the database that are approvals and project requests. And there should be a way to manage those tables or at least see the contents of those tables from within the admin interface. But okay. Yes, I, I can. I can answer this one. Okay. Uh, so it's available in the old admin web client. Okay. 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 Uh, yeah. When we just designed the new admin web client, we were constrained with time, and so we picked the most prevalent and uh, commonly used aspects, and the sure. project request, unfortunately, was not one of those. Okay. So the old. So with the old web client, there is a way to access the admin interface. Yes. Right? When you have admin, when you're listed as part of the, when you're listed as an admin, then that shows up as one of the projects 
that exactly. you can access in Correct. the old web client, and then you can yep. get to that admin interface. Yep. So is the old web client compatible? Old web client, let's say from 1.7.13, is that yes. web client software compatible with 181? Yes. Great, great to know. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> and I posted the link in there. Uh, I actually have a meeting right after this with uh, <laughs> a couple of people. So I'm going to, we're going to go over this just to make sure that this documentation that we have listed here actually uh, has a legacy plugin stuff in it. So it, it might be changing. It, it does though. If you search for the word legacy, it, it has a section on configuring the timeline that I think you can use. So also oh, it does? Okay. I kind of yep. looked at that. Um, but I, uh, I to be yeah. Let's edit it a little bit, Jeff, because it I, okay. I know what needs to be done, and it's not really clear. Okay. Let's see. Little... <laughs> Timeline yeah. does work. Um, I've seen it at UC Davis working. Yeah, all all of them should work. I think we've tested them. I uh, mm -hmm. I don't think we did the project request, uh, but I know we tested the timeline in the export XLS, and it has to deal with that uh, proxy, PHP. Okay. Other questions, thoughts? So definitely, you know, let us know, email us, you know, if you're, if, if anything comes up, if you have questions, um, thoughts, if you want to nominate yourself for the, uh, a, a board seat, or, you know, somebody that would um, be interested in the board, uh, please send in the nominations. Um, they get reviewed by the executive committee and then the approval is, is based on the, the full board's approval. So that's how that process works. Any other last minute things or we'll say goodbye and give you nine minutes back. Oh, hang on a second. Mark is back. Okay, Mark. I'm sorry. You know, I'm overseas right now. And so uh, for some reason, the, the connection dropped. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the um, thank you very much, Michael, for that, uh, for that information. Um, I think I had one other question and that was regarding the, um, uh, there was something that was demonstrated, I think, by uh, by Christian Weber. That's um, connection to an EIRB. I was wondering if there was any um, any status on that. Any integration is what you're talking about. Too? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, in other words, some way for um, for I2B to I2B to to. Uh, to um, connect with um, with IRB, and uh, I think that would be used. You know, it would be useful to maintain you know status on the researchers and see you know who is who is still accept, who can still have access to what. Perfect. His wake word. Well, he's a busy man, so I understand. <laughs> I can reach out to him individually. I thought maybe if someone besides Griffin has is using that or something, they can let us know where that's available. Yeah, we don't. I don't think we have it in our development plans right now. It's certainly, obviously, a um, something that would be useful. Um, it could be that some other organizations have already done something to to integrate to their own, um, you know, IRB application. But if we had something more general, then um, that would be that would be helpful. So def definitely, we'll put that on the list of things to think about. Because you know, one point eight point two isn't coming out for a while, so it it's we're in the process of of doing some development, but also gathering additional thoughts. So thank you very much. Anything else? I think most folks are. No more questions. Mark, do you have any more questions? <laughs> Diane, you made me laugh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> always, always good, always good to have you in these meetings, Mark. You bring up all the questions that everybody else is thinking about, so it's good. It's awesome. Oh, yay me. Okay, thanks. All right, all right. Well, I'm going to give everybody six minutes back. How's that? All right. Have have a great day, everyone. We will see you uh, in the November meeting. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.